Um, thank you for your analysis of what's happened in the court case in um, New York. And Judge Wilson, it's good to see you here. I just wanted to give a shout out to a fellow Bronx District Attorney um, alum as well. Thank you. Um, I did want to state for the record, you know, this discussion about homicides in New York City and the lack of prosecutorial action by um, the district attorney in the county of New York, that Mr. Bragg's first year in office, shootings in Manhattan declined by 20%, homicides declined by 16%. And the data from the NYPD shows that the rates of virtually every index of crime are lower in Manhattan for the first quarter of 2023 than they were at the same time last year. Um, so while we may not like him having prosecuted former President Trump, I think it's false to say based on the data that Manhattan is suffering from a rise in violent crime. That is not in fact uh, factually the case. Would we like to see it further? As a born and raised New Yorker, of course. Um, but what it is not right now is a place with a crime spree. One of the things that I talked about earlier today was Project 2025. Um, I've shared with the chairman my concern about this plan and the fact that this, I believe, fits squarely within the tenets of this committee to have a discussion about it, to uh, go to those individuals, the authors of this plan. Over a thousand pages have been written uh, that make up the Project 2025 um, by the Heritage Foundation, which they and its authors state is the plan for day one after a, a Trump second term presidency. Um, Mr. Wu, looking at Trump's playbook, that playbook being Project 2025, which is authored by individuals that are within his prior administration, how would it hurt Americans if these proposals were made into law? I think one way that I've touched upon is the removal or decimation of the career civil servants, I think is very dangerous. Uh, also, some of the other examples, the idea of removing the general counsel at the FBI to replace that with a political employees counsel. Again, you lose the experience and the context of that position. And similarly, trying to do away with the 10-year term for the FBI director, which is there to ensure that they can be in place over the course of different administrations. I think all of those, particularly at the Justice Department, would gravely hurt the integrity and steadiness of the department. I agree. Having been a political appointee in the Bush administration at the Department of Justice, working under the Deputy Attorney General uh, Larry Thompson, and then under uh, James Comey, who could have fared without a David Margolis having been in that office, um, being someone who had been there since the time of Kennedy. He came in as an honors uh, graduate from law school and provided consistency across the board to multiple administrations. Under Project 2025, if this individual did not, if David Mar an individual like David Margolis had not passed the loyalty test, would he still be in, in have that position? No. Um, one of the key tenets is also to defeat the anti-American left. That's a quote. Trump has promised to root out liberal prosecutors. Individuals on this committee have used the power of Congress to go after anyone who dares to indict Trump on crimes and publicly attack judges who rule against Trump or his defense team. Does this look like a fair and impartial system of justice to you? No, it doesn't. I think it undermines the democracy. Um, as a former federal prosecutor for many years, was it your experience that prosecutors in liberal jurisdictions approach the criminal justice system with an anti-conservative bias? No, it was not. And what was your experience? My experience was that federal prosecutors around the country uh, tended to be very independent-minded. Sometimes they would butt heads uh, with what we call main justice. Uh, but I pretty much never have seen an instance that I would identify as a politically motivated federal prosecution. Thank you. And um, I'm not gonna go into blocking financial aid 
for American college students if their states permit kids like dreamers to access in-state tuition, getting rid of school lunch programs, summer school pro uh, summer programs, taking aim at free speech and free thinking in American universities, aim at renewable energy, and what will make American women second-class citizens by taking a closer to a national abortion ban, restricting access to women's health care and abortion drugs across the market. This, again, Mr. Chairman, I believe is a document that we, along with um, others throughout Congress, need to take a closer look at. I yield back. The lady yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe Biden's DOJ has utilized their power and weaponized the justice system to go after his political opponent. From Florida, courts in Georgia, courts in New York, the farce that occurred in New York is a pathetic and sad abuse of the legal system by a rogue Democratic prosecutor and an obviously biased judge. As Judge Wilson aptly noted in his testimony, President Trump was railroaded and Judge Merchant drove the train. Not only did Judge Merchant seek to silence President Trump from informing the world about the judge's own conflicts of interest in the case, but he made sure to effectively muzzle President Trump's key expert witness, Professor Bradley Smith, on a central element of the case. Professor Smith, you correctly pointed out in your testimony that the district attorney's theory of the case revolved around a state law that prohibits promoting a political candidacy by unlawful means. In this case, the prosecutor alleged that the unlawful means resulted from a violation of the Federal Election Campaign Act. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were once the chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Is that correct? That is correct. Given your obvious status as an expert in campaign finance law, can you explain why the definition of an expenditure is so important to the case? Yes. Uh, the definition of this expenditure, if you just read the statute, says anything for the purpose of influencing an election. So a normal person might hear that and say, well, why did they make that expenditure? But if you read further into the statute, the provisions regarding personal use, and if you read the FEC's uh, regulations and its explanation of those regulations, what is clear what they mean is for the purpose of a federal of influencing an election is not the subjective motivation of the spender, it's an objective motivation. So setting up a campaign headquarters, hiring a campaign manager, buying TV ads, printing bumper stickers, whatever else you do like that, that's for the purpose of running a campaign. But the mere fact that you do something that might be helpful to your campaign, like uh, taking a weight loss program so you look better on the campaign trail, buying a house in New York so you can run for U.S. Senate from New York, settling complaints against your business in your private life, sealing your divorce records, those are not things that arose from your campaign. Those are things that people sometimes do anyway, and those would not be campaign expenditures. And were you allowed to provide any of that context to the jury uh, through expert testimony? Uh, no. And what is your expert opinion of the instructions that Judge Merchant gave to the jury regarding the Federal Election Campaign Act? Well, I think the judge's instructions were clearly wanting. All he gave them was that bare bones. If this was for the purpose of influencing an election, you've got a problem. And again, as has been noted in this hearing, he repeatedly allowed witness Michael Cohen, who's no expert in campaign finance law, and the prosecutors to state that there had clearly been a violation. I would note that had I testified, of course, I would not have testified specifically to what the law is, but I would have testified to the reporting system that would have shown that there was no advantage to not reporting this as a campaign expenditure, to the contribution system, which would have shown that Mr. Trump could have clearly paid this without any ramifications had he wanted to do so. I would have talked about how the FEC in practice had in many cases found that certain things that look like, you know, again, that for the purpose of were not found to be for the purpose of a, of a campaign and let the jury do with that what they will. And Judge Merchant allowed Michael Cohen, who has no expert qualifications in this field whatsoever, to provide the jury information on campaign finance law, but he prevented you uh, from giving substantive expert testimony on Federal Election Campaign Act. He, he did, and then, then he uh, advised the jury, now you can't use that to consider Mr. Trump guilty. Uh, that's only for context, which is sort of like saying to the jury or sort of like saying to you, for the rest of this hearing, I don't want any of you to think about a yellow minibus by Volkswagen. I mean, that's all you're going to think about the rest of the hearing is a yellow VW van. Um, it, it kind of flagged it to the jury's attention that Cohen had pleaded guilty uh, in this case uh, under, I think, tremendous pressure because he was facing years and years in prison for tax violations. So he pleaded guilty to the campaign finance thing and, and basically got a much lighter sentence. In, in the beginning of questioning by Chair Jordan, you talked about how we wouldn't want non-disclosure agreements of things that happened before a campaign to be campaign expenses. Can you just expand upon that? Right. I mean, I mean, you don't want 
members of Congress to pay for their, you know, personal peccadillos from year before uh, or allegations of such. Uh, I think we should, should credit those just as allegations uh, using campaign funds. Uh, you don't want a person to use campaign funds and say, uh, gee, this is something really embarrassing to me that happened in my past. I think I'd like to seal that up, even though it's not relevant. It's not something that you create it through, from your campaign. It's, it's the ticket for abuse. And this is why the law specifically lists a number of things. Like, for example, you can't pay for a country club membership, even if the reason you have it is to raise money for your campaign, because it's, it's something that people do even if they're not running for office. And we don't want campaign funds paying for it. Thank all of you for being here today. I yield back. Mr. Chair, I ask, you, back. I, ask you, I ask unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record a May 21st, 2024 AP News fact check article entitled Judge in Trump's Hush Money Trial did not bar campaign finance expert for testifying to defense. Um, the judge stated that Mr. Smith's testimony could was limited in scope of the testimony, which could be uh, that he could not give instructions to the jury on what the law was, and that it was the defense attorneys that decided not to put him on the stand. Without objection, and Mr. Smith addresses that in his written testimony. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. So, so Mr. Smith, following up on Mr. Stubbe's question, I want to understand the precedent here. So if a candidate for federal office wanted to use campaign money now to make a hush money payment, could they point to what has occurred in this New York litigation and say, well, I guess I can go use my donor money to make a hush money payment? I suppose they could, at least in, unless Judge Jackson is correct, and we'll have to wait for that overturning on appeal. But yes, that's Yeah, but it, so, it, well, I guess I want to ask the question, if an appellate court does not in some way deal with what has been laid before the country, could we, could we see people collecting money from donors, lobbyists, and PACs, and then using it to make hush money payments. Yeah, and you could do almost anything else. You could say, for example, I'd really like to go to the Super Bowl this year. I think I'll take a couple of donors along and buy your Super Bowl tickets and your whole trip to the Super Bowl because it's for the purpose of, of influencing your so, campaign. So in the prosecution to preserve our democracy, we have now greenlit potentially the most expansive abuses of campaign funds ever. Well put. So, all right, I just I have to test the limits of this. I do not like wearing ties. I would never wear a tie. I'm told that when people vote for a congressman, they like to see them wearing a tie in their advertisements. So does this now mean that when I go to Ross and buy a tie, that I should use my campaign credit card? Because otherwise, I'm not really a tie person. If you took seriously the subjective standard that was given to the jury as the instruction, Yes, it would mean that. If you took the objective standard that appears in the statute, no, you couldn't. So in the absence of some appellate review here, and this is why we have appellate courts to try to resolve these things, do we not, do we not unleash like the, this confusion and then this opportunity for fraud? Because here's, here's how this will go. Politicians will then simply use the gray area to enhance their own personal lifestyles through their campaign funds. Right. Yeah, that's correct. And one thing we should remember is that, that the Federal Election Campaign Act was elected or, or enacted against a background in which members could just pocket the campaign funds. And that was part of the whole idea was you're not going to be able to do that anymore. Ah, well, th thank goodness for the, the good prosecutors in New York who have unlocked the greatest potential for campaign fraud in the history of the campaign finance system. Uh, Judge Wilson, I just want to ask, ask you a, a, a precise question. Was there ever a case that you were presiding over where you had a family member economically benefit from the notoriety of the case? No, never. You sure you don't want to take some more time on that? Think about it. I don't need more time. I know that for a fact. Well, I mean, if that had ever arisen, would you have allowed a family member to make money off the notoriety of a case? I would have recused myself from the case. Huh. Well, it's just interesting because we had Attorney General Garland who was, you know, spent a good amount of time on the bench and I asked him the same question and, you know, he said that he wouldn't answer it because it was obviously a reference to what had gone on in New York. I mean, it, I thought it was, I thought he could, might could have answered it, but I mean, when you look at what happened in New York, does it concern you that the judge in that case seemed to have a family member who was economically leveraging the notoriety of the case? It greatly concerned me, but not so much from the perspective of the ethical violation that would be apparent because that judge did get an ethical opinion from the Judicial Ethics Committee in New York, 
that exob exonerated him um, from any wrongdoing in listening to the case when his daughter was benefiting. What I was concerned about was the appearance of impropriety. You know, when I sat on a bench, sometimes I would get a report from probation or some other organization, and they would hand it to me in an envelope. And I made certain to open up that envelope and show everybody that it was a report that I was looking at, because I didn't want there to be the, imp the appearance of impropriety that I'm receiving an envelope from someone in the courtroom. The concept is the same here. You, you're presiding over a case where your daughter is benefiting and where you've made political contributions in small amounts, but it's irrelevant, the amount, but you've made contributions to uh, the political opponents of the defendant before you. The, these are the very essence of the appearance of impropriety. And I feel strongly that Judge Merchant should have recused himself on that basis. Just simple as can be, Mr. Chairman, straightforward answer to a straightforward question. I wish we could have gotten that from the Attorney General. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record articles um, that discuss that the ruling of the New York Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics, which Judge Mershon took the judicious step of raising the issue with them about recusal, seeking guidance on whether he would have to recuse himself on the case, in which the committee ruled that there was no basis for recusal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll object pending just to, uh, what, where were the articles from? I will share, I'll give you a copy of those. Yeah, yeah, as soon as we have those, I'll withdraw my objection. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually want to follow up on my colleague from Florida uh, and his line of questioning. Um, as Representative Gates pointed out, the judge's daughter um, significantly profited from this case uh, to the tune actually of $93 million raised for her Democrat clients, clients that include a member of this committee, Representative Goldman, I should point out and put on the record. Um, but also uh, authentic campaigns of which Lauren Mershan, uh, the daughter of the judge, uh, she runs this, this firm, Authentic Campaigns, and was paid nearly $12 million for her work this cycle for her Democrat colleagues, uh, clients, and uh, including $9.7 million by the Biden-Harris campaign. Now, I know that there's been a tremendous amount of discussion today about the severe irregularities of the case, some of the things uh, surrounding jury instructions, but I wanna talk about the financial motivations for the DA and the judge. So Judge Wilson, you just said that he got a waiver from Judicial Ethics Committee, and you were pointing out how just the appearance of any impropriety it's to be taken very seriously. Can you talk about the Judicial Ethics Committee, who makes up that committee, and what are some of the, the processes that they would use? Would they consider the $93 million or her clients or a direct immediate relative that is benefiting financially from, from this case? If you're asking me who makes up the committee, it's a uh, combination of lawyers and judges uh, who are selected by the appellate division of New York uh, to hear uh, issues that judges bring to them asking whether or not uh, they can act ethically in particular circumstances. I myself availed myself of that committee on several instances. Um, when it comes to whether or not they should consider the amount of the contributions, I actually think the amount of the contributions are irrelevant because as you recall, I said, Judge Mershon shouldn't have made any contribution in any small amount to political campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, that's based upon a prohibition of judges being involved in political activities, except if they're in a window period uh, during their own campaign. Uh, at that time, then a judge's campaign may make a contribution to another campaign or to another political organization, but that's a, uh, a strict um, a strict requirement that it only be during an election when such a campaign is made. No, um, it doesn't matter so much what the amount of the money that mm -hmm. was being made. It matters that this is someone of first degree of relationship to the judge 
who is profiting from activities that oppose the right. defendant before that judge. And even if he had an ethics opinion exonerating him, saying it's okay, your daughter's not a witness and none of her interests are uh, being tried here. So the ethics committee thought it was just fine. There's still an appearance of impropriety right. that's of great concern to the public in general. And that's what a judge wants to avoid when you're hearing a case. You don't want people to feel that your integrity and that your impartiality is being is, impacted. Is compromised, right. Which, and that's what happened here. And, and the judge himself had given contributions, and I think you pointed out very appropriately that it doesn't matter if it was a large or small contribution, but the judge in this case, Judge Marchand, he contributed to a political action committee called Stop Republicans. That is inappropriate, and correct? He, he I mean, especially overseeing the case of the, the Republican nominee on the ticket, correct? He, he should have known better than to make the those contributions while a sitting judge. Right, and I mean, and, and I see our Democrat witness, Mr. Wu, you're shaking your head. I'm glad that you agree with, with us that this is a, a tremendous uh, question mark on the integrity of, of this, this trial. But, you know, I also wanna talk a little bit about um, DA Bragg. Now, I, I pointed out in our previous hearing that DA Bragg raised $850,000 in campaign contributions immediately upon the announcement of the 34 counts. Mr. Mr. Fahey, have you seen any other prosecutors run this similar arc of campaigning on getting a particular person and then using it subsequently to raise campaign cash? Not that I can think of. There might be somebody that's done it before. I think the, the DA or state's attorney in Atlanta, I think, is doing something similar with that case, uh, camp using that as a campaign case, her case against Trump. But other than those, I don't know of any. It's certainly possible, but, but you know, $800,000 for a DA's race is enormous. I know it, in your circles it's not, but, but those type of races are usually very low dollar amounts. So it's safe to say that there's financial motivation in the campaigns by multiple different DAs and politicians to, quote, unquote, get Trump. Correct. At, at least a political financial motivation, right. not necessarily personal. Correct. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield. Gentlelady yields back. Gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. I think there are a few things that should be cleared up today. First of all, we are not a democracy. We are a republic. I think it's extremely important to remember that and to understand our form of government. I also think that this is one of the reasons why people dislike politicians. We, we, we all know what's happening here. We know that Alan, Alan Bragg's prosecution of Pres President Trump is exhibit A of the left's by any means necessary lawfare campaign against President Trump. Alan Bragg's prosecution of President Trump opened a dangerous Pandora's box of politically motivated prosecutions of political opponents. And Manhattan District Judge Juan Mershon's decisions guided by political bias unfairly prejudiced the outcome of the trial and violated President Trump's due process rights. Anyone with a lick of sense knows that those statements are actually uh, cannot be refuted. We all watched what happened during the course of the trial. Professor Smith, have you ever been retained as an expert to testify on campaign finance matters prior to the case against President Trump? Yes. Okay, and briefly, what were the nature of those cases? What issues or federal laws did you testify with regard to? Uh, all of those were other cases uh, in which I was asked to testify about uh, past experience with federal campaign finance laws, customs and campaigns, how they pay for things. Uh, there were maybe as many as four. I don't like to do expert witness work and I don't normally do it. And uh, in none of those that you mentioned testifying, in none of those that I end up testifying either because the case is settled, because one is still pending, uh, or because in one other case, the judge decided that this would be testimony that would go to the law. Can you briefly describe your qualifications to provide such expert testimony? Well, as, as has been mentioned, I served as a commissioner on the Federal Election Commission, including a term as, as chairman. I've written uh, one book specifically on campaign finance and, and served as co-author on two others on campaign finance and election law. Uh, I have been uh, at one point uh, cited as one of the most cited scholars in the field of election law. A recent book from the University of Chicago Press suggested that I've had more influence on campaign finance than 
any other scholar in the last 40 or 50 years or something like that. So you're I've kind of devoted to, my life to this. This is what I do. You're qualified to testify about federal campaign finance law. This is Mr. what I do, Smith. yeah. Um, would you also agree that campaign finance law is a complex area and one where a lot of Americans who may have to sit on a jury would benefit from expert witness testimony to understand the alleged crimes that they are being asked to decide? Extremely so. At one point, Justice Scalia, when he was serving on the Supreme Court, actually said during the middle of oral argument, he says, this law is so complex, I can't figure it out. <laughs> So, Professor Smith, to the best of your knowledge, is Michael Cohen a campaign finance law expert? Uh, not to my knowledge, and not what I've seen. Well, yet Judge Bershon allowed him to testify as such during the course of the Trump trial, didn't he? Yes, in theory for other purposes, but nonetheless you had him repeatedly saying, this violated the law, you know, that violated the law. So, Judge Bershon commented when ruling to limit the scope of any testimony that you would provide that, quote, there is no question that this would result in a battle of the experts, which will only serve to confuse and not assist the jury, end quote. From the standpoint of someone who practiced as a trial for attorney for 34 years, I find that to be an extremely bizarre statement because that, in fact, is the situation anytime you have a case where expert testimony is needed. In fact, I worked on a case called Nebraska versus Wyoming at one point, and Wyoming had over 25 expert witnesses in everything from hydrology to ag engineering to economics to fluvial geomorphology to all of these things, and Nebraska had something similar. Yet the judge, including the United States Supreme Court, was not excluding expert witnesses simply because there was going to be a battle of the experts. Is that your experience? as well? That is, and I, and I would point out one thing I mentioned earlier, that there are a number of things I would have testified to that would not have gone to legal conclusions, but rather testifying about customs practices, about simply reporting dates under the law, and it appeared from the judge's rulings that even this, that kind of testimony would not have been allowed. He wasn't going to allow you to testify to those things, but he allowed Mr. Cohen to sit up there and say President Trump violated federal election laws, didn't he? Yes. Um, Mr. Uh, Professor Smith, going on, do you believe that the court committed reversible error by allowing Mr. Cohen to testify about alleged campaign, viol uh, campaign or election violations? I think it was erroneous, uh, and I'm not even sure what the standard, not being a criminal law guy, what the standard of review is for that kind of error. And, and sometimes if it's abuse of discretion, courts give trial judges a lot of leeway. But it doesn't mean the decision wasn't right, was, wasn't wrong. Judge Wilson, do you believe that Judge Marchand committed reversible error in excluding Mr. Smith but allowing Mr. Cohen to testify on these issues? In and of itself, that may not be enough to secure a reversal of the conviction, but there is a concept uh, in appellate law, a cumulative error. Mm -hmm. And what I believe we've seen in the Trump trial is a series of errors, one piled upon the other cumulative errors that when you put them all together show that Donald Trump did not have a fair trial and that his conviction should be reversed. I'm absolutely convinced that his conviction will be reversed. And I also believe that Judge Bershon was well aware of that when he made the decisions during the course of trial that he did. I found his decisions to be egregious, egregious reversible error on so many different levels. Thank you all for being here today. And with that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from South Mr. Carolina. Mr. Chair, before Gentlelady, that. Gentlelady, the ranking member is recognized. Um, I just, for M Mr. Gates and for your purposes, I have an article from Reuters regarding judge and okay. Trump trial, as well as the actual opinion of the Judicial Advisory Group of May 4th, 2023, and we'll make a copy for him. Okay. Without objection. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's been a bad week for Democrats. Um, not only is the border wide open, um, not only did just Main Street feel the pressure of 20% inflation, uh, but we saw uh, a pretty tragic uh, debate performance by the commander in chief. In fact, Democrats this week are discovering new tunnels on the way to and from the Capitol in which to hide from the media. And so they are now talking about things like Project 2025 and things to distract the American people from what they're really seeing, uh, which is a country that is not doing well under his leadership. It is a total distraction. Let's recap some of the main players we have here today. Alvin Bragg used a novel legal theory to bootstrap a misdemeanor allegation as a felony by alleging that records were falsified to conceal a second crime. Alvin Bragg is a pioneer of sorts, but in all the wrong ways. When you look at what he's done, he's paved the way for rogue district attorneys to campaign on and get elected to prosecute politically, uh, political enemies or political opponents. Then we have Judge Mershon, 
He was a top Democrat donor. His daughter worked uh, for Kamala Harris and even urged a uh, Trump Organization CFO to be a government witness against President Trump. But when President Trump requested he recuse himself, Judge Mershon said no. He performed an examination of his own conscience, which he found that he can rule fairly and that it would be, not be in the public interest if he recused himself from the case. A total farce. The, the left has really stacked the deck on this trial. Judge Wilson, why should Judge Mershon, we talked about this a second, but we're going to wrap up here. Why should Judge Mershon have recused himself from hearing the case against President Trump? A judge has an obligation to be fair and impartial and to appear fair and impartial. Now, Judge Mershon has the right to rely upon the ethics opinions that he received. He asked a question, he got the answer. But that isn't the end of the analysis. The judge has to also avoid the appearance of impropriety. In hearing the case, after having made political contributions and having a daughter, first degree of relationship to the judge, uh, profiting from attacking the subject of the trial that the judge is presiding over, has the appearance of impropriety. Judge, have you ever asked, have you ever asked specifically uh, a potential witness to be a witness in a case? Um, or have you let the prosecutors and the defense counsel pick those, their own set of witnesses? I leave that to the prosecution and the defense. The prosecution is the burden of proof. They decide what witnesses they want to put forward to prove their case. And the defense then has the ability to pre present whatever witnesses they want. Sometimes witnesses will be irrelevant, cumulative. There'll be other reasons they'll not testify. But in general, the prosecution and defense are the ones that pick the witness. So if a judge were to do that, in this case, Judge Mershon, to ask a, a, a former Trump CFO uh, to be a witness in a case, that would be improper. Is that correct? That's out of the ordinary. It's not always improper for a judge to suggest a witness, but uh, judges don't call witnesses in 99.99% of cases. Judge, um, you talked about this earlier, kind of a parade of, of errors that, that, what was the legal term that you used? Cumulative, these are cumulative mm -hmm. errors. So would the inability of Judge Mershon to recuse himself, would that be part uh, of a stack uh, that could be um, used as, by a court of appeals to reverse the decision? I believe so. What other grounds for appeal do you think uh, are evident uh, from your mind on this particular case? Well, I go right back to the indictment, and appellate courts like to rule on things that are pretty clear. Uh, a clear error is usually the basis that an appellate court will find and not go into a lot of other questionable issues. Courts like to decide things simply in most cases. Here, the indictment was facially insufficient right from the beginning. And it would have been a simple matter for Judge Merchan to dismiss that indictment and to give the prosecutor leave to represent uh, that indictment to get a sufficient one, to give uh, the defendant proper notice of the charges that the defendant was facing. That was not done in this case. And that led directly to the next significant error, which was not notifying the defendant of those additional charges until he was already at trial, and many of them not being notified, many of those charges not being, not being present until the jury instructions themselves. And then the jury instructions, of course, were wrong too. I mean, it was a 55-page set of jury instructions that were incredibly confusing uh, to an average juror. Yes, as well as to lawyers, for that matter, because I heard that comment more than once that, Many didn't know what, what those jury instructions meant. Thank you, Judge. Appreciate your time. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The uh, chair recognizes the ranking member for uh, closing questions and comments. Um, I really don't have any questions at this time. I just would again um, ask my plea to you, Mr. Chair, for us to have a, a hearing, discussion, interview with the authors of Project 2025. It is a 